And you don't lose hope. It may look bleak out there. It may look bad. God is a God of resurrection power. He has the final say. He always has the final word. They are not in charge. They are not the boss of everything. They are not the king. They may think they are. They may set themselves up. They may build their kingdoms and set upon their thrones. But I'm telling you, God has the last say. There is a king that's greater than all kings. His name is Jesus. King Jesus. Our Lord and our Savior. But he's also our king. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. He will not fail us. So I was looking at things this week. This, this prophetic word really just stuck out to me. It's called Ebenezer. It comes out of 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. I'm going to read this prophetic word. I'm going to set this up. The word Ebenezer means stone of help. Jesus is our cornerstone. He is our stone of help. It comes out of 1 Samuel chapter 7. After they defeated the Philistines, Samuel, <laughs> heard of God, raises his Ebenezer, the stone of Ebenezer, declaring that on the spot God defeated the enemy. Thus the words, hither by thy help I come. We have an ever-present help in time of trouble. This is from Veronica West. I don't know if you follow her or not, but she's on my Facebook as a friend and her stuff pops up and most of the time I don't even look at it or read it. I hardly ever look at any of it. But every once in a while, something catches my eye. Of course, we're in a time right now where we need a, the living stone. We need the cornerstone. We need the king who sits upon the throne to move in our midst. It says, watch, for the stone of Ebenezer shall be set up in the midst of your enemies. <laughs> God can use anything. He can use anybody that's willing. Oh, man. Come on. It says, this morning as I was before the Lord concerning a very painful and pressing issue that I am being challenged with. As if I began to cry out to the Father, not just, not just for myself, but for many others that may be faced with giants that seek to intimidate and frustrate the purposes of God in their lives. Suddenly I heard these words. Watch, for the stone of Ebenezer shall be set up in the midst of your enemies. Come on, not in the midst of the church. In the midst of our enemies. What the enemy is doing right in the middle of it. God is going to set the stone. Going to raise up the stone. When they thought it was... It was too late and it was impossible. Like that one song, there's nothing impossible with God. And then I heard the Spirit say, watch, for the stone of Ebenezer shall be set up in the midst of your enemies. Yes, I say to you this day, fear not. This is the hour of divine help and supernatural intervention. Listen, do you hear it? The loud sound of thunder, for the sound of my voice shall go forth like thunder to shake the heavens and the earth. The sound of my justice and righteousness shall be heard like the mighty roar of the Lion of Judah. He came as a lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. He fulfilled all the requirements of the Passover lamb. He fulfilled all of the sacrifice. And he's coming now, not as a lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah is coming. And he's roaring in the midst of our enemies. You can't stop it. You can't ignore it. They're going to have to deal with him. He cannot be defeated. He has already won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. Nothing can hold him. Nothing can stop him. A sound that shall pierce and penetrate the thick veil of darkness that covers the lands and the people. Watch, for I say again, the stone of Ebenezer shall be set up in the midst of your enemies this day. God is our help. And the sound of thunder shall bring forth confusion in the camp of your enemies. 
You shall go out to pursue, overtake, and recover all. I'm going to say that again. We shall go out to pursue, overtake, and recover all. Because that's what Jesus did. For I tell you, this is the hour of divine help and supernatural intervention. Yes, watch as my spirit now moves to bring intervention, restoration, supernatural preservation to those who have returned to me with their whole heart, to those who have turned from idol worship, and to those who have taken up the garments of servanthood. Ha, watch, for the stone of Ebenezer shall be set up, and the sound of victory shall be heard. For the hour of my help is now at hand, says the Spirit of God. The stone of Ebenezer means stone of help. Who is our ever-present help in time of trouble? Jesus. Through the power and the moving and the working of the Holy Spirit in us, upon us, and through us, we will pursue. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. We will overtake. and We will recover all. Oh, I believe I'm talking to a group of people that have come out from religion, come out from idols and idolatry and all the false that the enemy is set up to distract us from the truth. You know, they tell the lies to get you to stop believing the truth. It's all about, you know, light and dark, truth and lies. The more they lie, the more they are actually establishing the truth. Over It's getting stronger. It's growing in you and I. We're being raised up in the power of the Holy Ghost. We will do what Jesus did and even greater works than these shall we do. Because He's risen. He's not dead. He's not in the grave. He's the only, the only God that's alive. All the other religions worship dead gods, false idols. Made up man-made stuff. Man-made traditions and celebrations and all these holidays, this, that, and the other. The truth is in the Word of God. God's Word that He spoke through His holy prophets, through His men and women of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I believe the Word of God is the truth. And we're going to see the truth will prevail. Justice will prevail. The truth will come out. Watch and see. Watch and pray. The watchman. I believe I got a room full of watchmen here this morning. You're not hiding behind a wall. You're sitting on the wall. And you're watching. You have prophetic insight. Prophetic eyesight. You see what the you can see behind the facade. You see what's really behind it, the root of all evil, <laughs> the love of money. They're pursuing it. They're lusting for it. But we see the truth. You see the schemes and the strategies of the enemy. And you know that God has a greater strategy. God has already done it all. He's already conquered it all through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All power and authority has been given unto him. And he's turned and he's given it to the church. He said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And what you bind on earth is what's bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. He's given power and authority to the church. The ecclesia. The watchmen that are sitting on the wall. Seeing through the smoke screen. Seeing what the enemy is really doing and what his motive and what his end game is. And we stand in his way. And we will stand. This is a word from Paul Keith Davis. True prophet of God, I believe. He's not flashy. He's not shiny. He's a man of the word and the spirit. It's a word that he released about the watchman. I want to read it to you. The scripture that is built upon is Habakkuk 2.1. says, The watchmen are especially prepared for spiritual warriors who capture the Lord's desires 
and restate it to him in the form of an anointed prayer. Like Habakkuk, watchmen take their position on the wall to see what the Lord may speak. From that informed position, we're in the Spirit, we're positioned, we're aligned, and we're hearing what God is saying. See, we hear what the Lord is saying, so we know what His, what His end game, we know what He wants to do. We've heard Him, we know the desire of His heart. And then we're to speak that back to Him, pray that back to Him in the secret place. But then to step out and proclaim and decree a thing and see it as that. It's not just anything. It's what the Lord has said. The word of the Lord shall come to pass when you speak it out of your mouth in faith. From that informed position, God's people then know how to reply to Him with effective intercession and proclamation. Habakkuk said to one, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Paul Keith goes on and says this, revelatory prayer will carry the church to the end of the age. What does that mean? That means hearing from heaven. Hearing from heaven. Receiving revelation from God. What is he saying? What, is he doing? what do you see God doing? Behind the scenes. Forget the screen. Forget the, the movie. Forget the facade. It's all fake. It's all just like Hollywood. None of it's real. It's going to fall. It's going to crumble. It's the kingdom of Humpty Dumpty. When the false head rolls... The king's horses, the king's men, and all the kings under him will also fall and crumble and roll. Revelatory prayer. We got to hear what heaven is declaring. What is Jesus doing in the midst of our enemies? Prayer will carry the church to the end of the age. These will be prayers of laser-like precision and clarity. The union of revelation with intercession generates concise spiritual light that will penetrate the heavens with power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The revelation with intercession generates concise spiritual light that will penetrate the heavens with power. Watch and see what he will speak to me. It's good, I like that. It doesn't take a thousand. It takes one. It takes two. It takes three. On the wall, hearing. In the position to hear. See, hiding behind closed doors is not a position to hear. Hiding behind a wall is not a position to hear. You got to be in alignment and in agreement with his word. What is he saying in this moment? Just know what the heart, what his desire is. You know what his desire is because he's put his desires in your heart. When you delight in him, his desires become your desires. You want to do what pleases him. You want to do what he wants to do. And you want to join in. You want to be on that team. <laughs> We're not in fear. We're in faith. Believing God. Hallelujah. Man, it doesn't matter what the enemy does. He's defeated. He's a defeated enemy. It's all lies. It's all smoke screens. It's all, I'm telling you, it's just wasted energy. <laughs> because the King of Kings is coming. To destroy, to crush every kingdom of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. We worship the only true and living God. How about that? We have the only true and living God. Wow. Just to set a timeline, to dispel the lies, I said it before church, I'll say it again. 
Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples on a Tuesday. Wednesday, that was Nissan 13, and he began Nissan the first month. It's funny, like the car Nissan. The first month. Where'd they get that idea? And on the 14th, the next day, Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover. The night before, he had the Passover meal with his disciples, and we know the whole story. All of that took place in that upper room. Wow, even revealed one was going to betray him. He knew who the devil was already there. Was Jesus afraid? Did he think that was going to stop him or defeat him? That the enemy somehow was even infiltrated into the midst of Jesus' closest allies, his, his church, ecclesia, if you will. Those 12 disciples, one of them was a devil. And Jesus already knew it. God had already made a way, made provision. God already knew. Take heart, church. Take Let peace settle in you because God already knows what they're doing, what's going on. He's already, he already knows everything before they ever even think it. God knows it. So be at peace. Stay in trust. Stay in hope. Stay in faith. The day of Passover, Wednesday, they nailed Jesus to a tree at 9 a.m. At 12 noon, it became pitch black. The darkness came, flooded the earth. The enemy thought he had him for good. You know the story. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Isn't that amazing? The very ones that nailed him, that crucified him, that sacrificed him, that beat him, that, that killed him, murdered him, used the very weapon of the Romans, the cross, to crucify him on. Father, forgive them. He was full of love. Mercy and grace. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. He knew that his father would raise him on the third day. He knew that he was the Passover lamb. He knew that he had to die by the hands of evil men. Die for the sins of the world. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. It wasn't like any other man being nailed to the cross and being crucified on that cross. It wasn't like all that happened before then. No, we got to understand what happened. <laughs> Jesus became sin. He became, he was the Passover lamb. He was the full redemption for all sin, for all time, for all mankind. At that moment when he hung on that cross, all sin, all the demonic, evil, spiritual entities all converged upon him in that moment. Not like any other man dying on a cross. He was the sacrifice. He was the Son of God and the enemy knew him. The enemy knew Yeshua. And so they attacked him upon that cross. All the evil in the whole world. Can you imagine? All the demonic behind all the sin that's ever been coming upon that one man in that one moment. He says, he became sin. The sin offering. The full redemption. See, he had to become all of it to redeem us from all of it. Full redemption through the blood that was shed, through the body that was given to the sacrifice that was made. I had an encounter a few years ago when I was still in Praise World Outreach. They made a mistake of asking me to lead worship. We started leading worship, the Holy Spirit began to come. God began to move. And the pastor realized he wasn't in control. <laughs> so they killed it. One Sunday morning, 
I was leading worship. And the Spirit came in like a flood. And during worship, I'm supposed to be leading. I'm standing up on the stage leading. I'm supposed to be leading worship, and I'm caught up. I'm taken into a, a vision, if you want to call it that, an encounter. I wasn't on the stage anymore. He took me up, and I was standing before the cross. And Jesus was hanging on the cross. And I could see him. Just this, It happened so quick. Just a fraction of a moment of time, I saw him hanging on the cross. And just, I can't even explain, I, I can't explain it, but for an instant, a minute instant, as I gazed upon him, looking up at him, I felt the pain. I felt it just quicker than the snap of my fingers. It was just in and out, just there and gone. But for an instant, I felt the pain, the anguish, the agony he was going through for me. And I started weeping. People there didn't know what was going on. But I was laying on the ground before the cross and I was crying and weeping and weeping because I got a revelation of how great the price was that he paid for me. And instantly, the Holy Spirit took me and nailed me to my cross. I took up my cross. I bore my cross just like Jesus. And I died to myself. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. But just for an instant, I realized I am crucified with Christ. I was nailed to my own cross beside Him. And it was an honor. I didn't feel pain. I thought, yeah, he's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy to be nailed to this cross to die to myself. I died. I'm dead. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that lives in me. The scriptures really came alive. They just were kept singing whatever song we were singing. I had an encounter that changed my life. It gave me the strength and the boldness to do what I'm doing today. Without that, I don't think I could get out of the way. But it became no more about me, all about him. Whew, man, I feel the presence of God. I feel his presence, his glory. He's on this this morning. I, I don't even know what to do. I'm going to read out of Matthew chapter 26. And on Wednesday he was crucified. Before 6 p.m. they took him down. Wrapped him up. Put him in the cave. In the grave. Put the stone in front of the door. So he was dead like Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. We know that he descended into hell during those three days. And he took back the keys of the kingdom. Do you understand? Jesus went to hell for us in our place. He didn't just go there. He took back everything because of him being willing to go on the tree. He took back all the way back to Adam. It says when they crossed over into the, the, the promised land that the river Jordan backed up all the way to Adam. Jesus descended into hell all the way back to Adam. To the tree where Adam sinned. Where Adam fell. And he took back everything that the enemy had stolen in that moment. All the way up through history to this moment. 2,000 years ago. Jesus redeemed it all. He took it all back from the devil. That's how powerful our Savior is. The enemy couldn't. I mean, Jesus went into the very camp, the very headquarters of hell, and they couldn't stop him. He was just one, but he was the son. 
the Son of God, that had the Spirit without measure. He was just like his Father, God Almighty, creator of all things. He took back the keys of the kingdom. He took back death, hell, and the grave, and he led captivity captive. He led all those in the bosom of Abraham that had died in faith. He redeemed them. He resurrected them, and he brought them with him. It says he come up out <laughs> for 40 days. He walked upon the earth. He met teaching, instructing, preparing his disciples for what was to come. Because there was a backlash coming. There was a war coming on their faith. I'm telling you right now, there is a war coming, and it's coming for our faith. It's going to come up on those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe and stand in faith. That's what, the, that's what this is really all about. It's a war of light and dark. They're coming for you and I, and our president, Trump, is standing in their way. That's the truth. He's the spearhead, but we make up the rest of it. we got to do our part. Pray. Stand. Agree. Decree. Show up. Be led by the Spirit of God in all things. Can you imagine? So Jesus walked around Jerusalem for 40 days and nights with over 500 dead saints. Noah, Moses, Adam, Abraham, all of them. Jeremiah, Samuel, they were all with him. Walking around the city. Talking to people. Telling them about the king. About the lamb who is now risen as the lion. Uh, I can't even imagine. But it was to strengthen their faith. Because the war was coming. The attack was coming. Jerusalem would be destroyed again. Every stone would be turned on earth. They were looking for the treasures. The treasures of God. Hallelujah. But they can't have the real treasures. They're in heaven. They're in the treasury room of heaven. God has hid them for us to partake of. What a great salvation we have. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, up to 6 p.m., Jesus dead buried in the grave, in the tomb. Somewhere between Saturday, 6 p.m., the 17th of Nisan, and into the 18th, Jesus rose from the dead. That's what... <laughs> God raised him by the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that raised Jesus lives in us. We got to get a hold of that. The same Spirit, the same power, the same Jesus lives in Christ in me, the hope of glory. He's in us. He's wanting to show forth through us. He does the work in you to do the work through you. He has prepared us for this moment in time. I'm telling you, this, this generation, this older generation that's on the earth right now, we have been prepared for this time. We are the leaders. We are the leadership of the church. <laughs> We've got to lead in righteousness. We've got to lead with authority. We've got to lead in power and might. No fear. This generation that we are has more wisdom. God just did a great thing. We didn't even realize he was doing it. But he has prepared our generation for war. Right now, the generations that follow us, there's, just, there's a remnant. but There's a very small few. Most are deceived. Most are in darkness. Most do not understand the times and the seasons or what they ought to do. They're lost. We've got to lead. It's what we're called to do, to lead them. To have the heart of God. To hear Him, to know what He wants. To know His Word. To know the Holy Spirit. To walk in power and might. To lead the way. To preach the truth to them that follow. 
to set the captives free. To remove the scales and the veils and the blindness off of their eyes so they can once again remember. Remember their Redeemer and all that He's done for them. The Word of God is true. It happened in history. It was a mystery, but it's not anymore. He did it all. I'm telling you, He's, he's prepared us for this day. Matthew chapter, well, and then let me follow. So on early, somewhere between the next day in the Hebrew calendar, the next day starts in the evening at 6 p.m. when the sun goes down in Israel. And somewhere in that moment between then and when Mary came to the tomb, Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> he ascended into heaven after he had descended and done all the work. He ascended to his Father. He took his rightful place. He cleansed. He cleansed the heavens of all that the war that had taken place all those thousands of years before. He cleansed the true sanctuary. He was the Passover lamb. The supernatural spiritual sacrifice. The Passover lamb of God. He was throned. He was enthroned. And the elders did cast their crowns before him. And they worshipped him. He was raised in majesty and might and glory and power. Honor and love. Indestructible. Undefeatable. All things are possible with him. <laughs> Jesus. Sitting on the throne. Wow. He sent it up into the clouds. Acts 1. <laughs> they were prepared. They didn't know they were, but they were. Let me just read 26, 17, Matthew. We're going to get out of here. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? It's already taking place, by the way. Hallelujah. I mean, we've just lived through this whole week. And we're on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. He did. Somewhere between last night and this morning. He was not in that tomb anymore. He didn't have a crown of thorns on his head. He had the crown of glory. The Father crowned him with many crowns. And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, my master saith, my time is at hand and I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Just so you know, we don't celebrate Easter anymore. It's, it's, it's a man-made holiday. It's all man-made. It's all a facade. It's all a lie. But we should celebrate and remember Passover and all that Jesus did for us. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. When Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you. When he says verily, that means, boys, shut up and listen. Listen very closely, because I'm about to say something that will change your whole life. You have to hear this and understand this. I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. What do you think that did to those twelve? Wow. They probably start doing an inward inspection. Is it me? Does the enemy have anything in me? Could he use me in that way? And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Every one of them. See, they were just as frail in their humanity as we are. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Wow. <laughs> As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it. That's why we, this is the pattern of communion. Being in union with him. Communing with him. 
and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. See, it wasn't about bread or wine or any of that. It was about the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So when you take communion, whatever you use, keep this in remembrance. Do this. It's about the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's about what he's done for us through the cross as a sacrificial lamb of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks. Oh, man. Can you imagine Jesus giving thanks to his father? What a pure prayer. What pure words. It doesn't say what he said, but, oh, man, I would like to, to hear that. The little things, folks. And gave to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you, many for the remission of sins. Whew. This is my blood. He said, Drink it all. See, that's been part of the problem in the church is we drink some of it but not all of it we want some of what Jesus did for us that's why they built denominations they focused on one thing or just a, few, a short list of this is our tenets or this is what we believe this is our foundation of faith statement this is our vision statement they don't drink all of the blood they don't eat their full portion of the lamb. They just want a portion. Some of them just want to keep him on Sunday. Some of them just want to keep him on Saturday. Some of them don't want to keep him at all any day. It's all in. If you're not all in, you're out. In the coming days, if we're not all in, we're out. We got to be all in. Denominations are again man-made. Man-made traditions, denominations that divide the body of Christ. I don't think any of them are good. Because none of them are what God intended. None of them is what God, his purpose for the church. Can we just forget the names? Forget, forget the organization. Realize that we're part of a living organism. We are members in particular of the body that make up the body of Jesus Christ in the earth. Forget the name on the outside. Forget what the building looks like. It's all about the body and the blood. It's all about the communion with him. We have been made one with him. Don't separate him. Don't just take a part. Oh, I like that part. Let's live by faith. Justified. Yeah, I like that. Justification by faith. Yeah, I like that. Let's just be Lutheran. Let's just be Baptist. Man, well, I'm Catholic. Man, the hardest people I've ever tried to witness to are Catholics. Whew, they got a wall up, man. It's a strong wall. They don't want to hear about it. They think they got it. I'm telling you, in the last day, the true body of Jesus Christ is coming out from among them. We are joined to him. That's all that matters. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Man, that was a promise. He said, <laughs> he's supposed to remember those words when he was dead in that grave, when they saw him die on that cross. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they go out the next day. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written. See, the next day starts at 6 p.m. So it was Wednesday night into what we would call Wednesday and Thursday. Which they didn't go by those days or those names. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. He told him he was going to rise again. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Oh, he should have kept his mouth shut. He became the biggest offender. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, 
I say unto thee that this night before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me three times or thrice. Man, you know that crushed Peter. Because he did love Jesus. He loved him. But there was also a root of fear that had to be dealt with in Peter. There was still a little unbelief. It was just something that had a hold of him that Jesus wanted to break, cut off once and for all. Peter became one of the strongest and most boldest, and most powerful of the disciples, not afraid of dying. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the, all the disciples. Because we know what happened. When they took him, they scattered like sheep, just like he said. Then cometh Jesus with them into the place called Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him the sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and he separated himself and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He was human. That was his human side. He became as we are so we can become as he is. He became a man in flesh. He had to redeem us through our humanity. His deity was inside the humanity. His humanity said, if it's possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to die on a cross. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. See, there's the secret. You've got to die. That's what that encounter was all about. When I saw Jesus on his cross and I felt just for a second his pain, then instantly I was nailed to my cross. Take up your cross and follow him. We gotta to die to ourselves. Nevertheless, not I will, but as thou wilt. Not my will, but your will, Father. And as he cometh unto the disciples and find them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Because Jesus knew in just an hour or two they, he was gonna come, they were gonna take him, and then they were gonna crucify him on that cross, nail him there at nine AM, what we would call Wednesday. The next day after Passover, the Passover meal, it was actually the day of Passover, Nisan 14. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you still battle the flesh? How many of you still have a battle with the flesh sometimes? I do. We all do. He prayed again, second time, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, Thy will be done. See, Jesus was even struggling. He knew he had to do it, but his flesh really didn't want to. Ours wouldn't either, because he knew what was coming. We'd, have took, we'd been hiding somewhere, but he didn't. He knew who he was. He knew what his assignment was. He knew what he had to do for us. Anyway, let's skip. I don't know how far we want it. We know the story. All that took place. They nailed him to that tree. It was for the redemption of everything. All the way back to the first tree in the garden. See he was the tree of life. He is the tree of life. In the midst of the river. <laughs> the leaves. The healing for all nations. The sacrifice that he paid. 